Hello, welcome back again. Um, I hope you have a nice coffee break. We will move on with Michael Willis. Michael will talk about the significance of preprints and evolving models of peer review. Uh, Michael is interesting because he's a researcher advocate. I, I had to climb the stairs. I'm a little bit out of breath. This is a complex building. A researcher advocate of Wiley, the publisher company in the UK, and he is representing authors, reviewers, and editors in that company, which is an interesting concept to have a within representative of us, so to say. Uh, maybe you can talk about that as well a little bit, but the main thing of the talk is preprints and evolving peer review. You have a background in classics, I believe, uh, also the, the ancient history and including the literature in, in the, of the classics, um, and the president of the International Society of Managing and Technical Editors, you led. 216 to 17, which is an intriguing body as well and important for the publishing industry. So, Michael, without further ado, the floor is yours, uh, and we'll see each other back when we have the Q&A afterwards. There you go. That's very kind, Lex. Thank you very much. Um, and I hope you can hear me OK. And if I could have the first slide up, please. Great, thank you. So yeah, greetings from Oxford in the UK. Um, I'm immensely privileged and I'm very grateful to Lex and the other organizers of this seminar for the invitation to speak. Um, I've organized conferences myself and I know it's an awful lot of work and I've got huge respect for the um, organizers' patience and adaptability in such very trying and um, exceptional circumstances as we've experienced these last 18 months. So thank you and congratulations. Uh, next slide. So a little bit about me, first of all. Um, actually, sorry, could you go to the next slide as well? OK, sorry, back one slide. Oh, yeah. Um, so a little bit about me, first of all. So I've had a humanities education, as uh, Lex said, uh, ancient Greek, Latin, uh, history and literature. I've worked in scholarly journal publishing for over 20 years and almost all of that time in editorial roles. Um, and interestingly, mainly in health sciences. So quite different from my educational background. Um, Lex said I'm a research advocate at Wiley and in that role I'm exploring how we can support editors and peer reviewers in particular to provide an editorial and peer review process that is timely, efficient, it's compliant with um, all necessary integrity requirements um, and therefore this conference is particularly interesting to me. Um, in my role, I'm also monitoring initiatives and developments in what's going on in peer review, uh, which, of course, is going to be a, a big focus of what I talk to today. And incidentally, if I do overlook anything, then please accept my apologies. It's not deliberate. It's just that there is so much happening around preprints and peer review at the moment that it's difficult to do it all justice. And what I've tried to do is to distill um, the, 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 the things that I think are most significant at the moment. So today what we'll cover is first some context, and I think it's really important that I look at the impact of COVID-19 because that's had a transformational effect uh, on this area. Um, and then three factors that I want to address that have had an impact on developments in preprints and peer review. Um, of course, I'll look at preprints and peer review in some detail and talk about emerging developments and then uh, conclude with a glance at the future. Well, it is disappointing we can't all attend the meeting in person. Um, I'm glad some of you can, that's fantastic. Um, but travel restrictions mean it, it's quite difficult for, for many of us. Um, actually, the invitation to speak at this seminar landed in my inbox back in January 2020. Um, it's probably the longest lead time I've ever had to prepare for a conference. Um, I was looking forward to the trip to Amsterdam and to some good conversation and interaction at the conference. I'd even booked my Eurostar ticket in good time. Uh, well, I was very naive and I took an awful lot for granted. Um, speaking for myself, having had no experience at all of a pandemic, I anticipated that lockdown might last maybe a few weeks, a few months, and then we'd be back to normal. And of course, it was not to be. Um, when I was first giving thought as to what to speak about before the pandemic, I was anticipating I would give essentially a descriptive talk about how preprints are emerging as a major force within research and how peer review models are shifting. 
But among the unforeseen consequences of the pandemic are the acceleration of the dominance of preprints within the academic and public consciousness and the accelerated evolution of peer review models. In summary, what we have seen over the last 18 months is a greater rapidity in the pace of change. And so my argument today is not that the pandemic has changed the direction in which research publishing was heading, but it, it's dramatically accelerated the movement in the directions in which it was already headed. So a bit like how Eurostar accelerated the journey from London to Amsterdam, although it was always possible to travel between the two by train and ship. So let me use an analogy from the field of commerce. Um, and that's the point of my contactless um, icon there on the slide. I remember my first trip to Norway on business was in 2007. I was struck by how cashless, sorry, can you go back a slide? Thank you. I was struck by how cashless the shopping experience was. I'd taken cash with me, but I don't think I used a single coin or note for the whole time I was there. Um, everything could be paid for by contactless credit card. I don't know what the situation was in other countries at the time, but we were well behind this in the UK. Uh, contactless payment was starting to emerge here, but in very restricted circumstances. But of course, the need arising from the pandemic to reduce person to person contact through, among other things, exchanging cash in hand has led to the rapid adoption of contactless payment in almost every shop and outlet in the UK. It is now the norm rather than the exception. So we were already heading in this direction, but the pandemic accelerated the rate of change. And it's been exactly like that, I would say, with preprints and evolving models of peer review. But I think there are other factors that have contributed to the acceleration. I'm going to focus on three now. So the next slide. I think, first of all, uh, we are, sorry, can I have the next slide? That's great, thank you. So we are, I think, and certainly in the West, an increasingly impatient society. I'm using the term impatient without any judgment value. Um, let's take social media as an example. I've seen statistics suggesting that 20% of users will stop watching a YouTube video if it hasn't hooked them in the first 10 seconds. And the average time spent daily on YouTube is 18 minutes, considering there's an awful lot of long video footage on YouTube. 18 minutes isn't really uh, that long to, to look through all of the content that you might want to. Um, Twitter enables you to spread news about something before the established media channels get to it. Um, I've known that in my experience, I found out things on Twitter way before they've hit the, uh, the main media channels. Um, over a billion people used Instagram every month in 2020, the year of its 10th anniversary, with its pitch of instant messaging through images. And TikTok has a limit of 60 second videos, um, estimated to have over a billion users. Um, you can see that we very much live in an instant world. Um, my children tell me that email is outdated now. Um, I'm learning an email in my day to day job, but actually that it seems for the younger generation is very outdated and outmoded. Um, so I think, and you maybe can speak to this uh, um, with your own experience more than I can, um, the current and next generation of research researchers live and breathe an environment of ultra rapid communication. And in such a culture with the need to grab attention quickly and boost your viewing figures, you could plausibly argue that the risk of truth is the first casualty. And on the next slide, if I could have that, that takes me to the second factor that's had an impact on the communication of scientific research. That's the questioning of truth. Now, I'm not a sociologist or a philosopher, so I don't wish to comment on the meaning of the term post-truth, but we've certainly seen a proliferation of claim and counterclaim around many of the hot contemporary issues in the West. Um, I think that was even before Trump and Brexit and alternative facts and so on. Um, much has been on social media, but it's also affected the main media outlets. It's not just factual claims that are at stake, um, it's also images. So in case you're wondering who those individuals are that I've put on the slide there, those particular faces, I have no idea. In fact, they don't actually exist in real life. These faces have been generated by what's known as a GAN, uh, a generative adversarial network. They're entirely fake and you can generate your own fakes at the thispersondoesnotexist.com, that's the website. Um, but it's not just images, and perhaps you've come across 
the concept of deep fake technology, which can be used to generate fake videos, which is scary. Um, you know, you can actually have videos of people doing things that in practice they did not do. So when the tools that we rely on to validate claims are at risk of being undermined, it does become difficult to know how we can trust anything. So an impatient society, questioning of truth, and the third factor on the next slide, please, is a propulsion to greater openness. And I mean that in the very broad sense. In publishing, we've seen not just the move to open access, um, that was precipitated and accelerated, but I don't think initiated by the Budapest Open Access Initiative way back in 2002, uh, but there was already a movement before them. In more recent years, we've seen a move to open science, reinforced by the excellent and inspirational work of the Centre for Open Science. Um, they focused on, among others, open data, open materials, pre-registration. We've heard quite a bit about that already today, um, as well as transparent peer review. And the Centre for Open Science also created the Transparency and Openness Promotion, or TOP guidelines. That was all happening well before COVID and was gaining quite a lot of momentum before COVID. But with COVID, I think there's been greater pressure for scientists to speak transparently to those in the public square. The public understand very acutely um, that they have the right to know how scientific research is impacting their data, daily lives. Um, I think that's come out very much to the fore in what we've seen around reporting on COVID. They want to know how COVID data are being collected and interpreted. Do the numbers tell the truth? Is any information being held back? Um, there is this greater push and demand and expectation around openness and transparency. So let's go to the next slide. And it's time to explore how those various factors have impacted scientific communication. And let's start with preprints. So I define preprint as a manuscript posted by its author on a preprint server, usually prior to publication, and that has not undergone formal peer review. Um, there's an excellent survey of the landscape of preprints um, in the preprint, in fact, which is on, shown on this slide. Um, I recommend that to you. It's uh, really helpful in talking about the development and the current landscape of preprints. So what's been happening to preprints lately? Well, you can see here the numbers speak for themselves. The figure on the right shows the cumulative numbers of preprints indexed by Europe PubMed Central for each year since 2017. And you can clearly see the sharp growth that coincides with the pandemic. Uh, that is very, uh, very evident there. And on the next slide, this is what it looks like just for COVID-19 preprints. Okay, massive growth there in uh, since 2020, January 2020. Um, this work has been conducted and is updated regularly by uh, two researchers, Nicholas Fraser and Bianca Kramer, um, they're on about version 54, 55 of this at the moment, I think. Um, it's very regularly updated, and you can see the cumulative growth there. Um, note in particular the phenomenal growth of preprints on Med Archive, the dark blue area at the top, and I'm sure that comes as no surprise at all. Um, Med Archive has rocket, skyrocketed um, since January 2020. Um, and just a bit from my own personal experience. So well before the pandemic, I'd set up a Google News Alert for the term peer review. Um, I wanted to get a digest every day of the most recent articles or literature published about peer review. Um, and it lands in my inbox every day. Sometimes it's very useful. And I've been alerted to research that otherwise might have escaped my attention. So that's great. But what I noticed once the pandemic really hit in early 2020 was that suddenly nearly every alert was about COVID research and nearly every alert was about a preprint to do with COVID research. Um, I got the alert because almost all the time it said in a disclaimer, the work has not undergone peer review. So there was a preprint about a, a, some new drug or intervention or development. And it would say, this is a preprint has not yet undergone formal peer review. That's how I got the news alert, but it was really telling that so many of the alerts I got were about preprints to do with COVID. Preprints had taken off massively. So next slide. In the early days of the pandemic, there was immense pressure to understand COVID. What was the mechanism of the virus? How did it affect humans? 
Uh, what was its transmissibility like? How could it be attacked? How could an effective vaccine be created? And the great search for the, the vaccine, um, like the, yeah, the, the golden ticket, as it were. What were the implications on healthcare provision from nursing to surgery uh, and beyond, in fact, not just healthcare fields? What did it mean for social interaction? Um, and lots of psychology perspectives as well that are very important there. So from the publisher research, sorry, from the publisher perspective, it felt as though every researcher in the world in any field which had a bearing on COVID from biology to sociology to healthcare was relentlessly pursuing answers to these questions. That's how it looked to us. Um, we, there was clearly a huge race that had started to get things uh, out there. And there was enormous pressure, um, reputation, funding, kudos to be the first to provide answers. Um, a bit of a sort of an arms race, if I can put it like that. Now, journal peer review always takes longer than posting a preprint. Um, I think that's probably, there are rare exceptions, but that is pretty much the case. So preprint servers were naturally awash with new preprints being posted. Um, I've put on the slide here a picture of Dr. Anthony Fauci, who will, I'm sure, be familiar to you. Uh, he's now, of course, the medical advisor to um, President Joe Biden in the US. And he reported early last year that he would sit up late at night into the small hours, pouring over around 25 preprints every night just to try and sift through the latest research. In the early days of the pandemic, the Director General of the World Health Organization in the middle there, Tedros Ghebreyesus, he famously said, we're not just fighting a pandemic, we're fighting an infodemic. And with dozens of new studies being posted every day, it was important for science journalists to be able to discern the wheat from the chaff, so to speak, uh, what, was, what was reliable and trustworthy, as opposed to the stuff that really wouldn't make it beyond preprint stage, if you like. And the more that preprint servers could help with this, so much the better. I've got a tweet there that I've got a screenshot of from a BBC science journalist. Um, she was actually a former editor with the British Medical Journal, so she knows her stuff. Um, but you can see there the sense of frustration demonstrating the challenge that she faced in trying to get to grips with the literature that was being put out. So on the next slide, with this unprecedented growth, it didn't take long for preprint servers to realize that there were bad actors among the good ones. And even with the best will in the world, not every preprint had been properly tested and scrutinized by independent experts in the field. Um, certainly not enough to provide a basis for other researchers to work from. There was poor science as well as dishonest science, and Lex already talked about the spectrum of, um, of research practice or malpractice. So the preprint servers generally tightened their screening checks on new preprints, and they posted disclaimers like the one shown here on the preprint server sites to caution that the research had not yet been peer reviewed, and that was very welcome. Uh, that happened fairly early on um, in the pandemic. Analysis of med archive preprints in November 2020 um, that was published in JAMA, um, Journal of the American Medical Association, showed that by that point, by November last year, only 14% of preprints had actually been published in scientific journals. Now, of course, there's a time lag before publication, but still 14% is startlingly low, I think, for preprints to end up being published. Um, a small percentage of preprints have been withdrawn, um, I think single figure digits. And interestingly, the initial screening that was undertaken by the preprint staff, because on these preprint servers, preprints do go through um, initial screening of some sort. It's, it's not as extensive and thorough as, as peer review, of course, but it is a screening process. And that resulted in a 31% rejection rate of preprints that had been submitted. So those initial checks were able to weed out at least some of the dubious research. I think it's interesting um, as an aside maybe to think about who benefited from the disclaimers that um, I've put on there on those screenshots about peer review posted by the preprint servers. So who, who, were the benef um, who are the beneficiaries, if you like? It wasn't just for other researchers um, who are mostly aware of the distinction between preprints and peer reviewed publications. I think it was also a cautionary note for journalists and the public, um, and probably primarily for them to make them aware of this distinction. Um, and I think that's a really interesting consequence of the pandemic, 
And I'd argue that it's driven more of the public to engage with and understand the science behind the situation, making it clear that there is a distinction between what a preprint is and what a peer reviewed publication is. There was a really interesting post on the Scholarly Kitchen website back in June. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Scholarly Kitchen. It's um, a, uh, a blog website where there are posts about all sorts of things to do with publishing and research. Um, some of it I find frankly boring because it's not really my area of, of interest in publishing, but some of it is really spot on and really thought provoking. Um, anyway, it's worth looking at and checking out um, the Scholarly Kitchen uh, blog. Um, but back in June, there was this guest post describing how research misconduct didn't come about because of preprints. Um, preprints, it said instead, were perhaps the 10,000 watt bulb to shine a light on research misconduct. And I think that's certainly the case. Preprints have pushed this right to the fore because of the um, imperative of getting reliable research out there quickly about COVID. So on the next slide, I just want to talk a bit about the speed, um, if I can have the next slide, speed that happens with peer review. So is it good or bad? And opinion in the medical world is divided over the benefits of the rapid speed available through preprinting. This is quite an interesting dialogue, I think. So on the left there, I have Jeremy Farrar, who's the director of the Wellcome Trust. And he's strongly of the opinion, don't waste time, get the research out there. And alongside him is Marty Makari, of John Hopkins University in Baltimore. And he said this, he said, we cannot wait six months for the standard peer review process at a time when people have information that desperately needs to be shared. And he goes on to say that Med Archive is a great disruptor of our very clunky and slow system that was never designed for a pandemic or health emergency. It was designed for peacetime, slow movement. So you can, see where they're coming from. The need for speed is a good thing, particularly when we're in an emergency situation as we are with the pandemic. But interestingly, on the other hand, uh, Howard Bauchner on the right there, he's editor in chief of JAMA. He reported that the authors of JAMA articles on corticosteroids, uh, which became a, a really important in health intervention, of course, wanted the results of their study to be published and for the meta-analysis to go through peer review and not be posted on a preprint server because they knew this was going to establish corticosteroids potentially as a standard of care and they wanted the stamp of approval of peer review. So they trusted their research enough, I guess, to think that actually this does need formal peer review and we don't want to put it out there ahead of time. Um, if it goes out there on a preprint server, fine, it gets uh, immediate exposure, but actually we think this is more valuable or more uh, has more merit than just being posted on a preprint server. And so we're willing to hold back, which I think is a very interesting perspective on this whole subject. Um, my former colleague, Chris Graff, uh, who, who was at Wiley, has, has written this about preprints. He said, preprints have given us all an injection of what we most needed in any year, but particularly a year like the last, speed. Preprints broke out of the science press into the media and they became mainstream in 2020. I think that's absolutely spot on. Okay, let me turn now to uh, the next slide and I'll turn to look at the dizzying world of emerging preprint developments. Um, do be aware that some fields are developing much more rapidly than others. In biology, for example, the pace is faster and the themes for these initiatives are focused on discoverability, commenting, finding new reviewers and speed. So I'll, I'll go straight through this list. First of all, COVID-19 Rapid Review is a multi-publisher collaboration under the aegis of the Open Access Scholarly Publishers Association. And that facilitates the rapid identification and review of COVID-19 articles by posting them as preprints. Um, it's also tried to create a volunteer reviewer database experts who would undertake to review rapidly. Then Review Commons, and again, another multi-publisher collaboration, which enables preprints to be refereed prior to submission to a journal. Rapid Reviews COVID-19 is similar to Review Commons, but comes from MIT Press. Um, it seeks to identify and review relevant preprints and to publish some in its journal. So it's doing a bit of curation there as well. Prelights helps researchers discover and comment on preprints. 
uh, pre-review crowdsources reviews of preprints, not just COVID research, um, more general than that. And then there are a couple of initiatives from ASAP Bio, um, ASAP Bio crowd preprint control, first of all, sorry, crowd preprint trial, which uh, crowdsources reviews of preprints. And then they've just uh, announced a preprint reviewer recruitment network uh, with uh, multi-publishers a trial helping to expand the pool of reviewers, sourcing them from reviews of preprints. Um, so being creative in the way that they can get peer reviewers or reviewers of preprints. Peer Community In is a sort of an overlay journal. It recommends preprints and helps researchers discover them. And the last one on my list there is Society or Society, never quite sure how to pronounce it. It's a sort of a journal club facilitating the review of preprints and creation of preprint lists. And of course, other developments are things such as funders increasingly mandating preprinting. Um, eLife, the publisher, now mandates preprints. Um, you cannot submit to eLife unless you've preprinted. Preprint editors are scouting for preprints. Um, there are integrations between submission systems and preprint servers. We do that at Wiley. We have um, an under review, sorry, we have a preprint alerta, but we also have something called under review, which uh, ties in with the Authoria preprint server for a growing number of journals so that authors can submit to a journal and at the same time preprint their work. And there are real time updates on the Authoria platform of the peer review process. And there are similar uh, services at other publishers. Okay, that's preprints. Let's turn to peer review. And on the next slide, um, preprint, sorry, peer review is formally um, understood, takes place after submission to a journal. And what we're seeing with preprints is a massive experiment in moving peer review further upstream in the publication process to solve perceived problems of traditional formal peer review. But I just want to dispel four myths about peer review, first of all. One is that it's always been this way. Now, Eileen Fife at the University of St Andrews in the UK uh, has done some really interesting work to make the point that peer review is often thought of as ancient and unchanging, but it is in fact neither. Um, the current model of peer review as we have it post-states the Second World War, um, and it's worth evaluating to see if it can be improved. We shouldn't be afraid of change. The second myth is that there's only one model of peer review, uh, one form of peer review. Um, I think much of the heavy criticism of peer review is built on the assumption that peer review is pre-publication and anonymous, organised by a small cabal of editors. Um, but I'm sure, as you'll be aware, that peer review is much more diverse than that. A third myth that um, I do hear is that peer review is unpopular. Uh, it's on its way out, it's dying. Um, but the fact is that researchers consistently support journal peer review. Survey after survey shows this with fairly um, you know, strong numbers of researchers supporting peer review. Um, there was a Sense About Science and Elsevier survey in 2019. That was the last large survey um, that, that showed this very clearly. Um, but other surveys are out there as well. And the last myth I'd like to dispel is that there's a shortage of reviewers. Um, perhaps that's surprising to you. Um, I know that COVID has certainly highlighted the fact that many researchers have had less time to review and editors increasingly report that it's much harder to find reviewers now and in previous years. Um, that is a trend that predates COVID in fact, and has been reported well before the pandemic. And I'll come back to that shortly. Um, I just want on the next slide to point to uh, an initiative that's come from ASAP Bio called uh, Reimagine Review. This is really worth looking at. It's a log of new initiatives in peer review. And as of uh, this month, it's got 51 ongoing initiatives that it's recorded in its database in a whole range of disciplines and from different publishers and organizations around different emerging um, patterns in peer review models. So that's worth uh, going, I, I commend that to you to have a look at. Okay, next slide. So peer review models have evolved to tackle a number of perceived significant problems. And pretty much every initiative around peer review is seeking to solve one of these problems. Um, I've tried to categorize them um, according to different problems that peer review takes too long, first of all. So we've seen how preprints have really taken off to try and solve the problem of peer review taking too long. Um, Serge Horbach, who is going to be speaking uh, later this conference, in fact, this seminar, 
did some research last year showing how peer review of COVID research accelerated in some cases from taking several weeks down to several days. Um, the post-publication peer review model has sought to accelerate peer review um, for journal articles. Um, F1000 was a leader in this area. Authors can publish their articles online and take it through multiple rounds of review until a final definitive version is published. Um, and, you know, it's becoming increasingly hard to see clear blue water between this and the process of taking a preprint through to final publication. The lines are blurred, if you like. Um, and I mentioned just now about the trial of crowdsourced review that ASAP Bio is organizing. Um, but interestingly, the technology behind that trial, that pilot, was created by a company for journal peer review. Um, the thesis is that you can invite a curated group of expert reviewers with an interest in the article to review much more rapidly than the usual journal peer review process. So that tackles the perceived problem that peer review takes too long. Next slide. The second problem uh, that's reported is that the quality of peer review is poor. And certainly the desire to accelerate the speed of peer review can come at the risk of compromising integrity. I think that's, that's evident in, um, we've had high profile studies from a couple of top tier journals um, retracted because of research integrity problems. Um, that they were peer reviewed and there were issues with the way they were peer reviewed. There were, there were failures in the peer review process, if you like, but it doesn't have to be that way. And you can have speed and integrity I think, if you have the right processes and safeguards in place. So um, at Wiley, for example, we looked at the whole uh, process of peer review for everybody who's involved in it, from the editorial office to journal editors to independent peer reviewers. We came up with something called the Better Peer Review Self-Assessment, where you can look at uh, all those different parts of the process and seek to reinforce and improve them. Uh, so self-assessment leading to improvement around peer review processes. Um, and something that's close to my heart is um, the theme of academic kindness. Um, I think quality of peer review can be looked at in terms of the way the, the, the comments are fed back to authors. And there are well-attested examples of reviews that have been totally disrespectful of authors, uh, which is unacceptable as well as unprofessional. Um, you could see comments like that, of course, on preprint servers, so it's not just about journal peer review, um, but I think open peer review, for example, where comments are posted publicly should encourage greater accountability on the part of the reviewer, uh, of course, especially if the reviewer's name is posted, um, but that accountability needs to be there. Uh, next slide. And this is about peer review being a black box. So peer review is seen as having a closed nature. Um, it's secretive, it's not transparent. And transparent peer review does seek to solve this. We launched this at Wiley in 2018 in partnership with Publons, um, meaning that once an article was published, its whole peer review history, including the reviewer reports, the decision correspondence and so on, are posted on Publons. And there is uh, a taxonomy project going on at the moment. Uh, I think uh, Joris van Rossen uh, is going to be talking about that a bit and that seeks to improve the transparency around peer review and perhaps around peer review quality as well as transparency is having a standard score sheet that you could use to uh, help reviewers understand what's expected of them when they review for a journal and how to guide reviewers into giving constructive and consistent feedback. I do want to um, conclude my, my big section on peer review if you like on the next slide um, by talking about the shortage of reviewers. I promise to come back to this. Um, so there is evidence to show that on average, an editor in 2017, for example, needed to send um, <clears throat> far more invitations out to peer reviewers to get one peer review report done. Every editor I speak to says that finding reviewers is a major pain point. And yet, and yet, there is evidence as well showing that researchers in emerging regions uh, and underrepresented regions are not being asked to review. So, for example, China performs 8.8% of reviews, but it delivers 23.8% of published articles. And there are other regions of the world that are in a similar situation um, with a disproportionate amount of um, research being published compared with the amount of reviews they're doing. And we need, as publishers and journal editors, 
to ensure that the reviewing burden is more evenly distributed. So I don't think there is a universal problem with reviewer fatigue. I think we're not good at finding reviewers. That's the problem. Um, and something else that ties in with this, and which is a big theme at the moment, of course, in uh, all areas of research, it's come to the fore really strongly in the last couple of years is around diversity, equity and inclusion. And it's really important that editors look beyond their own biases, their own, um, their own makeup, their own demographic, to look for greater diversity in the reviewers that they invite to review. And of course, that's really important for early career researchers as well. It's really important that we give them the opportunity to um, learn peer review. OK, um, my next slide is just to um, put out there, uh, and I'm nearly done, uh, some things for the future. And I think we can expect greater breadth in terms of how peer review is done, looking at different types of peer review, different sorts of articles. And on the next slide, I think there'll be greater specialization in review. So we'll need reviewers who are expert in data, methods, ethics, coding, that sort of thing. Um, and on the next slide, diversity I've mentioned, we need greater diversity of the reviewer pools, whether that's racial, ethnic, gender, I think as well, citizen science, that's something that people might want to, to ask about. And on the next slide, diversification of uh, research outputs needs more technology to support peer review, uh, machine learning, AI, and so on to support humans doing the peer review. And that's really important for quality and integrity. I love the way stat check can be used, as we heard just now about that um, in helping peer reviewers assess statistics. And then, Next slide. One other thing to look out for is a changing dynamic in the way that power shifts from editors to the authors. The authors can choose the authors. We have a very author centric approach to um, research. OK, next slide. And I think I'm very nearly done. Um, so these are exciting times in general publishing. I have a picture of an exciting sort of splurge of lights going on there. There's a lot of opportunity at the moment in changing the research and research communication processes. And I think my last slide is just to say thank you very much for listening. And I hope that's inspired you to think up some good questions for discussion. Well, thank you very much, Michael. The, this was really fascinating and interesting, this, this fastly developing world of, of media and publication. And, and most of us um, have no clue where it is heading, whether we will publish our research on TikTok or a similar uh, uh, platform in, in future. We don't know. Um, lots of questions popped in. Uh, I, I'm, I'm no, I, I, I assume that you're not a clairvoyant, but, but you need to try. Um, one question is, um, and, and that might be an easy one for a start, how can we assure that peer review is fair? Because you alluded to that, uh, that there is some unfairness in peer review as well. well what, what, is this, what is your favorite solution? Should it be open peer review or are there other means? Should we train peer reviewers? Should we give them a license or, or whatever? What, what, what is your thinking, Michael? Yeah, I think all of those actually, Lex. I think there are different strategies for different um, sorts of what you talk about when you talk about fairness. Is it about being fair in terms of uh, the comments that you feed back, being constructive? And that's where my academic kindness thing comes in. I think we need to make researchers more aware of the issues around uh, what is helpful in doing a review, so some training. Um, I, don't, I think there's evidence to show that formal training isn't particularly effective, so I think there's a cultural change that needs to happen there, but when early career researchers are learning about peer review, they've got to learn that um, in, you know, the need for fairness has got to be paramount. I think what is a really good motivator is to say if you're the if you're looking at um, someone else's research, how you look at that should inform the way you do your own research and you see it as a virtuous circle, if you like. Um, you review fairly, you get your research improved because you're learning the same sorts of skills, the critical thinking, um, you review as you would like to be reviewed as well. Um, so different strategies. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, that makes sense. And, and, and um, Wiley, do, do you have a blacklist of, of poor peer reviewers? 
Um, we, okay, we don't have a blacklist of poor reviewers, but editors will know for their own journal communities uh, who can do a good review and who can't. Um, and they may, you know, if, if I were a journal editor, I would probably say, mm, I think so-and-so is the right person for this particular topic. Um, you know, there are hawks and doves in peer reviewers as well, aren't there? There are the ones who will be much more, um, uh, I don't know, expansive and effulsive in their, um, the way that they review an article. Some will be much more critical. Um, and I think that peer review is essentially a, a social phenomenon, isn't it? It's about behavior and people come with different faculties, different approaches, different perspectives. Um, yeah, so it, it's really fascinating. Yeah. Well, thank you. I'd like to move on to the, to, to the preprint part of, of your talk uh, that, that has been engaging many participants as well. I, I'm lumping two questions now. Um, one is um, many or maybe some journals, it, it's improving, are don't like preprints. They, they think this is publication and we want a fresh manuscript that has not been published. Uh, how, how can authors handle that, how can they sort it out and how is why they're doing that? And the second question is, how can we um, be, be more convincing to researchers to go the road of preprinting? Because there are clear advantages, as there are disadvantages, of course. How can we motivate people to, to do more preprinting, uh, assuming that journals, many journals already do allow it? Yeah. I so, Wiley, we love preprints. We're really supportive of it. I think journals have to be, have to flex with the times and they have to realize that preprints are here to stay. Um, okay, there's greater, um, there's greater movement in some fields, biological sciences, for example, than in others. Um, they're slow in social sciences and humanities for all sorts of clear reasons. Um, I think, uh, I don't know, my, um, my slightly rebellious approach to this would be to say you vote with your feet. If a journal doesn't like you pre-printing, then probably find a journal that does like pre-printing um, because I think there are so many benefits to authors in pre-printing. Um, uh, you know, for example, getting your work out there, primacy of the research, um, getting exposure prior to peer review. So being able to improve your um, article if you get comments on it. Um, I heard a talk yesterday where somebody was saying that although there are no public comments or that only 14% or something of articles pre-printed get public comments, uh, the authors do more often get private feedback from people uh, you know, in response to preprints. So there is some benefit to authors in getting that research out there in the public domain um, and it, it's available. Um, and I think motivating um, yeah, what is there to lose is probably the position I would take. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, it, it, it's really an interesting field and it, it's rapidly developing, of course. Um, so, so some people um, are, are, are wondering about the concept you alluded to of post-publication peer review. Um, can, can you elaborate a little bit on that and, and maybe also say whether there is a place for citizen science there as well? Can, 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 can users uh, in, in the lay public also participate in post-publication peer review, t t in your opinion? Yeah, so post-publication peer review, I mean um, where an article, it, this is where the thing gets a bit blurry because in a sense, um, yeah, you're, you're publishing the article and then you're getting formal feedback on it. So F1000 does this and you end up with multiple versions of published articles. It's really hard to know what <laughs> the published article in a way um but yeah so that's what i intended to mean by that um citizen science absolutely um can be involved in post-publication period but i would argue it can also be um involved in uh further upstream as well um there is no reason why uh, well depends what you mean by citizen science i suppose crowdsourcing feedback um yeah if something's po posted publicly and it's available for all to see, then why, what is there to stop people from doing it, uh, from commenting? Um, you're back to the question of expertise in peer review. So uh, there's not much value in um, somebody who has no clue about the subject commenting on it. Um, I would argue there's a stronger case for sort of experts by experience, if I can put it like that. So. I think of the patient reviewers on medical journals, for example, 
um, you know, you've had bowel cancer surgery um, and you're commenting on the way that uh, uh, research about bowel cancer surgery has um, been described uh, from your own personal experience. I think that's incredibly valuable and adds a new dimension to um, the way that research is communicated. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's really interesting what you, what 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 you're saying, and the point is, of course, um, and that's my personal opinion a bit. When you have post-publication peer review, it might be a good idea to have versioning as well, to to uh, to open the possibility to to publish an updated version of your paper, like platforms like F1000 Research are are doing already currently. Is is widely moving in that direction as well? Yeah, um, and the other thing about that, incidentally, is the transparency that comes with it, which I think is really critical. Um, so at Wiley, we don't have any journals at the moment that do post-publication peer review in that model. Um, we, our approach is that we flex with the communities. Um, so where there are community demands and expectations, then absolutely we, we, we can explore those routes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, well, thank you again, Michael, very much. Um, I hope you didn't tell us a company secrets, uh, but you will learn <laughs> later on today, most likely from your chef. Uh, but thank you very much. I, I, I really liked your openness and your presentation. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, and, and let's move on to the next speaker of today. Um, I hope he's somewhere already uh, online. Yes, I can see him sitting there. Um, good morning, uh, Daniel. Um, the next speaker is Daniel Lakens. He will talk about replic replicability and especially about the replicability crisis and the way to, to solve it. And the subtitle is The Way Forward. Now, Daniel is an experimental uh, psychologist um, at Eindhoven University in the Human Technology Interaction Group. Um, he's doing a lot of research in uh, cogn uh, cognitive and social psychology. But I know him mainly as, as a strong methodologist. He, He's working on research met methods in general, replication, statistical inferences, and, and you may or you may not know it, he is famous by his MOOC uh, on Coursera, 50,000 students uh, teaching tough stuff in methodology, and that's very useful. Um, and, 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 and well, maybe it's, it's a nice fit to the last uh, meeting, um, the last lecture, um, Daniel is also teaching on Twitter. He publishes Twitter threads that are like uh, lectures sometimes, and, and they're quite engaging. Sometimes I I'm, I'm stick them and I send them to my students. Um, <laughs> finally, um, he was, Daniel, the, the, the godfather of replication research in the Netherlands, as he single-handedly convinced our National Research Foundation to start a research program on replication research. Uh, it's, it's, the money is now gone, so we are now also uh, trying to get some more money for the extension of that program. Now, Daniel, your topic, you have a, a lot of time. Your topic is replication crisis. Uh, we will spend the last 15 minutes, I hope, uh, for interaction and discussion. Uh, but for the next uh, three quarters of an hour, the floor is completely yours. There you go. All right, thank you so much for that introduction and for organizing this very nice uh, meeting today. Um, I'll share some uh, slides that I have. I hope that they are uh, visible to the rest of you. Um, I will talk a little bit about the way forward. And as I was reflecting on this question, I thought it's actually quite a difficult question. Um, so you'll see me struggle a little bit with what I think the way forward should be because there are replicability crisis, as it's called in psychology, started around 2011. There was a lot of criticism on findings that couldn't be replicated. There was also some other events in the environment, like fraud cases, although not directly something that um, are related to replicability in terms of not being able to replicate a finding that's a true finding. Um, they also motivated a lot of people to think about how we can improve the way that we do science. And I have to say that I was quite early involved in such projects. I had an interest in promoting replication research. And we started with something that was later published as the um, replicability project in psychology where a hundred studies were replicated. Um, the goal of this project was to determine whether there actually was a problem or not based on some data, at least providing some information about whether there even was a problem to begin with. 
Um, a lot of people thought that maybe the problems were a bit exaggerated. It wasn't that bad. So around 2012, people started on this large project to replicate 100 studies. And in 2015, it was published. And at that time, you could really not ignore the fact that there was some sort of crisis. Crisis in the extent that many people felt slightly upset about the state of the field, right? So this is a subjective experience that things weren't as good as they are supposed to be or could be. I remember around 2015 that I was quite hopeful about the progress that would be made. So at that moment, if you'd asked me about the way forward, I would say, well, this is clear. Replications are very important and we're going to do more of them and that will all improve things in the long run. Now, in my own field of psychology, something else happened, actually. Um, not just didn't replications take up uh, um, much more space in journals than before. I mean, a little bit, but not that much. But what we actually ended up doing, uh, to a large extent, was just create more crises. This uh, started around 2000. 17 or so, I think, but some of the papers that have been published on this since then are uh, papers about the presence of a theory crisis in psychology. So our theories are actually not good enough even to begin with. Who cares about replication? Our theories are just weak. There's also work on um, measurement and validity issues. If our measures are not reliable or valid, who even cares if you can replicate it? Because if the measures are not valid, what are we even measuring to begin with? So that's uh, second and third crisis, validity crisis and a measurement crisis. More recently, people have argued that because we don't really test whether our predictions generalize, we just make very local observations, we can't make big claims, even though we love to make big claims. And maybe we want to make big claims and should want to make big claims as a science. We should want to say things, hey, you know, everybody should try to do something like this because this is likely to work. The argument here is that because we don't study things in a way that allows us to generalize, those big claims are completely unwarranted. And more recently, people have said that there is a practicality crisis. So even if we do this nice lab research and we have these theories and we have these more abstract uh, ideas about how people work, we rarely test them in practice. So we don't even know if we can apply our insights. Turns out that we are very good at creating a lot of these crises, but we don't seem to be particularly good at fixing them so far. And this is, I think, an interesting observation, um, something that uh, seems to be a red thread throughout the recent years. We are very good at pointing out things that are wrong, but we are not particularly good at fixing these things yet. So I wanna reflect a little bit on why this might be the case, and also how this is related to aspects that have to do with research integrity. Uh, because I think there's actually a strong link between this, although it's not always discussed in such a way. So I'll try to make the link a little bit with the values that scientists have and the way that we do research. One thing that I think that if we are serious about wanting to fix these crises that are pointed out, all of them, which have some merit, uh, it seems that nowadays people really like to debate which of these crises is actually the worst or whether they are actually crises or not. But I think we can all agree on the fact that these are all aspects of our research process that we would like to improve. And we can all agree that something like replication is often desirable, but it is also not the end goal. And if we don't have good measures, then we need to fix that as well. And if it's not applicable, then we need to fix that as well. So all of these things are things that we should work on. The problem is that the fixes are most likely of such a, a level, uh, that the requirements to fix these things are of such a level that they're highly likely to make us feel quite uncomfortable as scientists. Um, moreover, I think it is highly likely that it will change the way that we do science from current practices to the extent that it will require us to give up certain freedoms. And that isn't very weird because if we look at other crises that are going on, we can think of maybe the climate crisis. We probably to a certain extent agree that this is also a problem, maybe more important than science crisis that I've just mentioned, but we there have the same issue. 
a lot of the things that are required to fix these things should make us feel uncomfortable about the way that we are currently living our lives. We make us reevaluate what we are doing and how important things are. And they might also require us to give up some freedom. We're not able to do everything that we were able to do before because there are certain limitations uh, and certain things that we should value enough to give up a little bit of the freedom. And I think in science, it might work the same way. We might have to start to feel a bit more uncomfortable than we are, and we have to give up a bit of our freedom to, to go beyond these problems, the replication crisis, but also these other uh, problems that have been pointed out. If you think about how we can do reliable science that fixes all these issues that have been, been done before, then one thing should be kind of clear. It is a lot more work to do science that is replicable, that builds strong theories, that uses valid, reliable measures that have been well validated, that produces findings that we know generalize well beyond this one sample of Dutch undergraduate students in which it was tested, or maybe where we know where it generalizes to and where it doesn't generalize to so that we really know how applicable it is and not only have an idea of how applicable it is, but we have tested it in practice, which itself is very difficult to do. So all of these aspects are a lot of work, much more work than I think most people uh, thought it was to make a claim that everybody should just take seriously. We need to start replicating studies, which will take up time. We need much more work to seriously test different theories and exclude false theories, which will take more time. We will need to develop these measures. It's also very time in intensive. We need to study the same thing, not just once or twice, but if we're serious about generalizability many times all over the world, and then we need to do reliable large field studies to see if these insights can actually be applied in practice. So there's a big difference between how we used to work when I maybe entered my field. And again, I think I'm talking about psychology, that's my background, but I think many of these things play a role in other scientific disciplines just as much. And we see actually that these crises inspire other fields to think about these topics and they'll probably come up with similar issues that play, or play a role there. So from the point back then where we were really maybe overclaiming and treating scientific insights way too simplistically, we now have a field where we realize that there are all these aspects that we just need to improve to create useful, valuable knowledge for society. So there are a couple of things that are required to achieve this, I think, and those might require really big changes to how we work. At least there has to be a certain level of coordination just for the simple fact that nobody is going to spend four years to really reliably validate a measure if there is nobody who's actually going to use this measure in the future. There has to be some sort of coordination that the people who work on validating measures do this for people who will actually use these measures in the future. All these kind of tasks have to be coordinated to a certain extent because otherwise we're just left hanging whether somebody is going to perform them or not. We need to create valuable knowledge together in much larger teams probably than we've been doing now. So there are a couple of consequences of this, but I think one central point that I would like to make is that we need to think about this quote, apparently by Donald Hepp, also a psychologist, but it's written down in a paper by Daniel Dennett. And he writes, if it isn't worth doing, it isn't worth doing well. And this is maybe after a long time of thinking about the replication crisis and how to move forward, one of the things that we are not really discussing so far. Which of our research is actually worth doing well? So for which research are we gonna invest all the resources to go through all these steps that all of these crises are resolved? So if we wanna have a discussion about the research that's worth doing well, then we will have to have an honest discussion about the value of our science. Which things are we doing that have real value for society in some way? And I guess in some ways, this has to be an uncomfortable discussion because now if we really wanna raise the bar, 
we have to have this discussion about where our resources are going to go to. And to a certain extent, it means that sometimes these resources are not going to go to the thing that you really liked to do. And that is an uncomfortable thing, but I think a necessary thing. For the simple reason that if we want to have an answer to all of these crises, we have to put in the work. So if you know, want to know whether something replicates, after a lot of statistical tests and insights and people looking into whether we can predict replicability, it turns out that really the only way that you can know whether something replicates is to replicate it. So we have to do these studies. And we have to do this for every finding that we find important enough to make a claim about. Now, that's a lot of replication studies that will need to be performed in the future. If we want to know if a measure is valid, we can't just trust it like many people do, but we have to validate it. If we want to know if an effect generalizes, we need to do it in multiple places. The same study will need to be performed many times again, and not just exactly the same study, but slight variations as well to see whether the basic principle generalizes. If you want to apply it, we need to start doing large field studies and apply it. So all of these steps take so much time that I don't see another route forward out of this replicability crisis than consolidating the research questions that we have resources to really seriously address, to really do well, and to um, give society some valuable insights for then, then reducing the number of things we study and do some of these studies collectively. So we will have to start spending more resources on the things we do if we really value doing them well. And this is the question that we need to ask ourselves. Um, do we really think that the research we are doing is worth doing well? Because if we don't really believe this, then what are we actually doing as scientists, right? And I know that this sounds on the brink of almost a sort of trivial uh, question uh, that you should think of what you're doing is important and valuable. But it is not such an obviously true thing. Um, last summer, I spent some time talking to scientists who believe that the research they do lacks any value whatsoever. It wasn't very difficult to find them. And they have all sorts of actually pretty good reasons for uh, thinking that their research lacks value. And that's not societal value. It's not that it won't, you know, end up in some sort of practical application on your kitchen counter. That's not what we're talking about. Some people said I do highly theoretical work, but also for the theoretical contribution, it has no value. There are all sorts of reasons, but a lot of them boil down to a lack of coordination. PhD students who say, look, I'm studying this for four years. I'm laying a foundation for this research question, but there is not a student who will follow up on my research. Nobody's going to pick this up after four years. There's no plan of continuity, no coordination that what I am doing is a necessary step for people further on. There are also people who said, I've been studying this for decades and people keep giving me grants to study this because they think it is important, but it isn't important. They don't realize we already answered this question long enough. We don't have to keep studying this. We need to study other things. I mean, all sorts of reasons why people feel that they're doing some research that they actually don't think is valuable enough to do well. And a couple of people were fair enough to just say this, talk about it. But I think for many um, of us, just considering this is, is slightly uncomfortable. Having to feel like, is what you're doing actually valuable enough to do so well? But I think we will have to move forward and, and ask this question. And in essence, it is a question about waste. It's a question about research waste, which I think has an, an ethical or a, say, a, a, an, yeah, an ethical component. Um, if we want to contribute something to society, we have to make sure that the end result is valuable. And if we agree that this requires this large amount of work, then yeah, we have to start asking the question whether what we're doing is valuable enough to do well. So I think we're, we're not going to fix any of these crises um, unless we manage this. And that's not to say that we haven't been busy in the last years fixing things. We have been busy. We have been very busy with making incremental changes that improve certain things about the way that we work. Um, we're fixing some of the core issues underlying replicability, for example, but maybe not really the core of why these problems emerged. So let's very briefly talk about three of the things that I think many people now accept were underlying causes of the lack of replicability 
in many empirical fields. Um, there are other reasons probably, but there are three things that are mentioned a lot. The first is flexibility in the data analysis, sometimes called p-hacking, so it's mentioned before. Um, this is a practice where you flexibly analyze your data until you are able to confirm your prediction. You can tell the story that you want to tell. The problem with this practice is that you have inflated the probability of making incorrect claims, sometimes so high that you can make a lot of claims, but most of them might actually be wrong. So this is p-hacking. The second problem is low statistical power. That is that people are collecting data sets that are so small that we can't really learn anything meaningful from these data sets. But more problematically, that if we find a significant effect, it is most likely an overestimate of the true effect size, something we also saw in the um, reproducibility project. Not only did a lot of the effects not replicate, but it was also true that on average, most of the effects were about 50% as large as in the published literature. And one problem uh, leading up to this is lack of power in our statistical tests. And the last problem is publication bias. Publication bias means that we only publish those results that support our predictions. This in itself doesn't just muddy up the claims that are available in the scientific literature, right? This practice means we can't take claims in the scientific literature at face value because they're only part of what's happening. But this problem that is still ongoing is a very clear violation of the code of research integrity. I find it absolutely um, impossible to understand why we accept this state for such a long time, for decades, hundreds of years actually, that we accept this, even though if you read the code of conduct that we have, it clearly says we should treat no results the same way as positive results, but we don't do this. But let me take a look at why all of these things have some sort of um, value-related thing, I think. I'm trying to reformulate these practices. I mean, of course, they inflate error rates and they do all these practical things, but I, I want to take a look at these practices from a different perspective. From this perspective of is our research actually valuable enough to do well? Do we believe that our research is valuable enough to do well? Because that I think is the core of the issue. If we don't honestly believe that, then, then we can get all these problems. So a reinterpretation of p-hacking, why this is problematic from this value perspective is that the work that you are doing is so inconsequential that no one actually notices when you have been making false claims for a very long time. That is a real problem, of course. I mean, the fact that we end up with many wrong claims, that is a consequence of p-hacking, but the real underlying problem as a field is, this should have really led to some sort of problem somewhere, but apparently it didn't. So there's no real pushback from anything that makes these practices consequential. Whereas if we would produce very valuable research, this should be more consequential. Second thing about low power, although I fully accept, and I'll get back to it a little bit later, I fully accept the difficulties of being able to collect sufficient data. This is a real limitation. And we can talk about whether science funding should be increased and all these things, and I completely agree. We live in a practical reality where we have limited resources as researchers. But still, it is up to us as a scientific community to decide how to organize these limited resources and which scientific questions to put these limited resources to. So low power, again, reinterpreted from this value perspective, actually means that as a scientific community, we do not think it is valuable enough to do this well, which would mean to team up as scientists and collectively study this in a way that we get clear answers. There are some very positive developments on this specific front, by the way. Um, in psychology, there are different initiatives that really have tackled this issue and have thought about, okay, so how do we first choose studies that are important enough to do well and then get people together to do this? One example is the Psychological Science Accelerator. This is, of course, a wink to the particle accelerator at CERN, the same idea that we work together and build one big resource that we can use to have very informative tests, 
So the psychological science accelerator is one example, but there are also many labs studies where people are pulling together their resources and studying the same thing, like the many babies project. Developmental psychology is an area where it's very difficult to collect enough people, um, in this case, sometimes babies. Uh, babies are uh, not the most uh, diligent participants to any study, so it's very difficult to get good data, but by pulling their research together, they're addressing this question. Now, they're addressing it in a way by first collectively deciding what they're going to spend their resources on. So all of these people are now collecting data for a greater goal. And actually, in the remainder of this week, I'm teaching PhD students at Zurich. And they are, one of the people there is participating in this Many Babies project. And that basically means she's spending some of the time of her PhD where she can collect data, not on something for herself, but she has decided that it's important enough to spend some of this time collecting data for something that the community thinks is important. So there are definitely some good examples here of improvements, but taken in the total scope of what the field is doing, these are very small very small aspects. And if we seriously want to solve this, this should be part of most research lines. And the third thing is publication bias. And again, translating this into a sort of value perspective, the problem here is to a certain extent that the research you are doing is not valuable enough to be written up. Even if writing it up would seriously change what we think is the truth about certain things. Right, especially with publication bias and no results. If you don't write up a result that is counter to maybe published findings in the literature, it means that you don't consider your research valuable enough to correct even a claim that has been made in the literature. Maybe I'm saying you don't think it's valuable. Of course, value is created within a system, but it means that as a system, as a scientific community, we apparently don't value, in essence, the truth over a selection of the truth, right? And that's a very peculiar situation. It is a value issue, right? We have to talk about why don't we value the truth over the other things we are doing. That's an uncomfortable discussion, but I think we have to, to have it. So, so here I'm really thinking of reformulating some of these problems that we have been trying to address in piecemeal fashion as a bigger, yeah, to a certain extent, it's a bigger integrity issue, right? We're talking about values, about scientific values here. So the problem is that none of these problems, replicability, generalizability, applicability, I mean, all these things, we will not improve them until we start an honest discussion about the things that we value. Um, what do we put in, what do we think is important? And when are we willing to put those values before other things that are also important. So as scientists, I think, and this is of course a moral point, I mean, this is, uh, we can disagree on this, but I think as scientists, we should want to do research that is worth doing well. That should be a priority. We shouldn't just want to do research. We should want to do research that we can do well. And that might be the change that we need to make to solve these problems that we have been facing, which requires a discussion about which research we think is important enough to do well. So we can have collective discussions about this in research communities. Which research questions should you prioritize? Where are there things that somebody needs to do but nobody is doing, but collectively we believe that they should be taken up? This happens in some fields. It doesn't happen a lot in my field, but there are some fields where there is a practice, for example, known as consensus conferences. So these are conferences where the community comes together and decides, has, been, has this thing been established well enough so that we can accept it? Or do we need more studies to um, determine this more? Are these measures that we're using validated well enough? Or should we, as a community, make sure that we are collectively working on validating these measures that we use and that we care about? Um, even to questions that are done in these fields about, well, which effect sizes are actually interesting enough here? Can we reach some consensus on the goals that we have with our interventions? How big should the effect be that we're aiming for so that it's actually meaningful and not just statistically significant? Because then as a community, we all have an aim to determine whether the effect is large enough to actually matter in practice, for example. 
So these things happen. They happen in other fields. They don't happen in my field, but I think consensus conferences might be an interesting way to discuss with each other what are the things that we value? What are we going to spend these limited resources on? And for which things are we going to go through this whole route of actually building good theories and making sure that we have valid and reliable measures and um, testing whether they actually have an effect in practice. Right? I mean, we often put this in our discussion. We should, uh, you know, we can apply these findings there and there and there, but we actually should test that, right? I mean, because we might have a lot of findings that are all fine and interesting, but if they have no relevance for practice, they don't meet the goals of the researchers themselves. Now we can have value discussions on a very broad level. What's the value of doing science to begin with? I don't want to promote that. That I think is far too difficult for where we are. I am really talking about specific value discussions where groups of researchers who have already decided that they want to study something. So I'm not talking about whether you should change your research direction or whether you should, should even stop being a psychologist and become something else. No, groups that have decided that they want to spend their time and money and resources on in examining a certain question, how can those groups have a discussion about which types of studies in their specific field are most valuable to do first so that they prevent all of these problems that have been pointing out so that they know their findings or their most important findings are replicable. So what we should do for this is put science first. <laughs> I know that's a kind of silly thing to, to say seriously, but this is a statement that is actually the motto of a large pharmaceutical company. And I once talked to the statistician who works for this pharmaceutical company. It happens to be one of the companies that helped us create uh, one of the vaccines for the COVID um, crisis. And in this company, they had this motto, science comes first. And I found this very funny that they, they explicitly mentioned this and not just explicitly say it, it wasn't a hollow value. They really acted upon this. Um, and I found it funny because I thought, how many scientists actually uh, really say this? Put science first. Originally, this was a thought. This was a thought of the people who were at the very core of yeah, what we now consider um, our approach to doing science. I think this quote on this slide is by Bacon uh, from his Novum Organum in 1620. And I think most people use this to sort of indicate what an almost unrealistic value for scientists is. Like we can't even take this seriously anymore. But in his time, he was serious, I think. He said that this was an important value. Let me briefly read it because he's talking about the reasons to do science. And he says, lastly, I would address one general admonition to all that they consider what are the true ends of knowledge and that they seek it not either for pleasure of the mind. So we shouldn't just do science because we find it a nice intellectual puzzle. That's not the reason. Or for contention, just makes us happy. It's also not important. Or for superiority to others. The fact that you can introduce yourself as professor, blah, blah, blah. No, not the reason to be in science. Or for profit. No money should be, a, you know, the fact that you can pay your mortgage, nice, shouldn't be the reason you're in, in science. Or fame or power or any of these inferior things, but for the benefit and use of life and that they perfect and govern it in charity. And this is a value, right? This is a real scientific value, putting science first. We do it for the greater good of society, for other people. And every choice that we make when we do science should be inspired by this. Now, this is very difficult to achieve uh, on an individual level, but it's worth having a discussion about how we can do this as a collective. It also means that we will have to do, to a certain extent, what needs to be done and not always what we want to do. And uh, I'm setting up some points for discussion later today, but I definitely have the feeling that sometimes we have too much freedom to do the things that we want. Nobody is forcing us to do the things that need to be done. And sometimes it's good to be forced to do the things that need to be done. For example, um, I once visited CERN, which is a large collaboration where many people work together. And there they have some sort of task division that if you are part of a project, you also have to do certain chores, like checking someone else's code to see if there are no mistakes in the code that someone else wrote. This is a chore. Nobody really wants to do this, 
But collectively, they have agreed upon the fact that this is important to do. This is valuable to do. So you have to do certain things that need to be done, even if you don't really want to do them. And it is good for the collective. I have exactly the same situation at home. I don't particularly like to do uh, something like vacuuming every weekend. But we have agreed here at home that it is important to vacuum. And I have to do it because otherwise we get into problems with the collective that we have here. So there should be situations like this where you have to do chores that feel like vacuuming, that are not as fun as other things you need to do. But you give up a little bit of this freedom for the collective because you're contributing to something that we all have agreed is valuable. So we rarely do this, I think. Rarely happens, right? And we have discussions about having to share data or having to do replications. These are all these situations where we have to do them because the collective values them. And if we put science first, we should do these kind of things every now and then. So if the scientific community decides that it's important to check code, and I think that uh, we see that especially for important papers that are published, we don't want to have mistakes there, then we should check code. If the scientific community has decided that it's important to share data, and again, we can have a discussion about whether that's true in all fields or when it is important, when it isn't important, when it is possible, when it's not possible. But if we have decided it's valuable to do this, then we should do it. If the community decides it's important to do replications, then we should do them, right? It should be part of the tasks that we have to perform. So if science uh, comes first, if we have this perspective, almost this Baconian perspective on how to do science, then we have to give up certain amounts of freedom a part of our time will have to be spent on things that are important for the collective um, because we are providing a surface um, for science that, that is important to do. Now, I spent a lot of my time in the last decade, I would say, to trying to make sure that people make incremental changes to the way they work. So we try to prevent p-hacking by educating people about the problems of it or by pointing out that if they use techniques that are known to inflate the alpha level, such as optional stopping, repeatedly analyzing your data as it comes in and stopping when it is significant, that there are correct ways to do this called sequential analysis where you nicely control your error rate. So yes, I write these papers and I try to make these incremental changes, prevent things here and there. It has some effect. Some people change the way that they do this, but I think they don't get us out of this real crisis. This real crisis requires this discussion about the values that we have. So there cannot be a simple fix if people don't really believe that their research is worth doing well. If you don't honestly believe that publishing your work as a registered report is the best way to share your results for the scientific community, but you only do it because you want to jump through some hoop, right? So if you don't really have the value underlying the behavior that you're supposed to perform, then you apparently don't think that the research you're doing is important enough to do well. And that's fine, but maybe then we shouldn't do it, right? If it's not worth doing, it's not worth doing well. Another frustrating thing for, for my experience, experience doing this for about a decade is that it feels that these incremental changes are like a game of whack-a-mole. There's just another issue that will pop up the moment that you hit one of them down, right? And it keeps being like this. I can share my, my latest failure on this. I wrote a preprint earlier this year trying to make sure that people write honest sample size justifications. I think that's nice if people can be honest in their papers. So instead of sort of spinning a story that is not very realistic, I ask people just to honestly say how they justified their sample size. What did they do when they select their sample size? And of course, we would like people to make sure that they select the sample size based on um, their goal to have a very informative study. Right? So they have enough data to, drew, to draw good conclusions. So that's ideal situation. But I wrote a paper where I say, I understand that there are resource limitations in the world. There is lack of time. There's lack of money. And if this is the case, be honest about it. So I wrote, there is a justification for your sample size that is based on feasibility. And this is actually almost always the case. There's always a feasibility limitation to your research. Then I also wrote, 
if this is the justification for your sample size, if you are collecting a certain number of observations just because this is the best you can get, then you have to address a couple of tough questions. Namely, if it is not informative in itself, will a future meta-analysis be performed? Which values can you actually say something about given your small sample? And is that even important? Or is it the case that your feasibility limitations actually led to a study that is just not interesting? It is not worth doing this study. And I stressed, this should sometimes be the outcome. But instead, what you see is that people start to cite this paper just to say, look, we had feasibility limitations. And that is a fair enough thing. Let's just be honest about it. And then they cite my paper. But I would like them to stop citing my paper in this way, because that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying if you have feasibility limitations, you have to answer these tough questions about whether your research is actually valuable enough to do. But they skip that step, right? So it's an infinite game of incremental changes, making things, whereas people should really Start by thinking, is this research valuable enough to do in this specific way? And the answer sometimes should be no, but it seems too difficult to get people to accept this. So, so it's a bit of a personal frustration here that as we try to improve research and get beyond all these problems that have been pointed out, it really sometimes feels like a game of whack-a-mole. Right? You're trying to make these incremental changes, but it seems like people don't really want to do research that is important enough to do well, right? So it makes me wonder why that is the case. So I think that um, if we want to move forward, um, reflecting on this a bit, and I mean, for me, this is, uh, you know, some thoughts I've been having, maybe it has something to do with older age or things or slightly more skepticism, taking a look at what has happened in the last couple of years. But I have the feeling that these incremental changes have very limited impact. And I think what we should be doing instead is asking very uncomfortable questions about the value of our research. Honest values are, are we putting science first? Are we doing the things that, that are most important to do? And are we doing things in a way that we feel they're worth doing well? So this will mean giving up some freedom. It also means making sure we have people in science who are comfortable giving up some of this freedom. Right? Not people who just want to do everything their own way, but team players, people who can really contribute to team science. Um, we can have a discussion about whether we are selecting for individuals who think this way about science or not. I have some, some ideas about this, but uh, we can discuss it. But that would be important, right? If we want to move forward, we should be happy to give up some freedom for the benefit of the collective uh, and have people who are willing to do this. Because this is the only way that we can um, make sure that the resources we have are put to the best use so that we do the things that we think are most important and we do them well. Of course, this is a difficult process, building consensus like this. And I don't think we necessarily need whole fields to agree, but we need larger, much larger teams of researchers to agree on what their goals are. So this is, I think, a summary, right? We have to make sure that if we wanna get out of the replication crisis, we put science first. I like this claim, we put science first. We make sure that it's valuable enough to do well um, and, and have an honest discussion with each other about what this actually means, an uncomfortable, honest discussion about what this means. All right, thanks. Thank you very much, Daniel. This was not uh, at all a disappointment. I really liked your lecture. Um, a lecture from an insider, so to say, because I remember reading one of your blogs explaining how you struggled as a PhD student by being so stupid because you could not replicate what you find in your field. Um, and, and you did something with it. I especially like your historical flavor, um, bacon, reflective flavor, a bit of philosophy. Um, it's great. And, and many in, in, in the participants, they liked what you did as well. So there is a, a whole body of questions and remarks and I try to navigate more or less through it as good as I can already apologizing for the people who we cannot uh, give the attention they deserve. Um, may we start with Rick Pales. Uh, Rick will talk about replicability in the humanities in the afternoon's program. Uh, so he was a keen listener, I can imagine, to your talk. And he says, well, it's interesting. Um, you started with uh, a listing six crises. And, and Rick's question is simple. Couldn't we summarize these six crises 
as being a trustworthiness crisis. Yeah, yeah, I think they all build towards research. Some, there are some slight uh, differences in goals, so it depends. But trustworthiness is a good summary. Some people call it a credibility revolution, which sounds at least a bit more positive. Um, and then the question is credibility towards which goal. So trustworthiness of the findings by themselves is one thing. Generalizability is not really necessary to trust a local claim, but that sometimes goes beyond a little bit of the goals that we have for science. So trustworthiness is a very central part. I think the crisis goes beyond this even, um, because even if we have trustworthy findings, we can have trivial, unimportant trustworthy findings, or we can have trustworthy findings that don't apply broadly enough or that have no impact. So, so I tried to make it a bit bigger. I think some of the criticisms are bigger, but many of them have a link to trustworthiness. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, the, the next point I'd like to raise is is raised by um, Alma Linkevitsch. I, I need to take lessons in pronouncing surnames in in many languages. I apologize again. And and she brings up a, a, an issue that that has been brought up a lot. Um, is indeed everything in theory and in practice replicable? Uh, there are many people in the humanities and also in the social, social sciences, they say, hey, listen, you, you cannot just replicate a study. That's, that's stupid trying to do this. And, and what do you say to, to these criticisms? So there, there are many cases where this is true, where things are not replicable because we cannot repeat certain events that have happened, for example. Um, the goal is not replicability per se. I mean, some people value it because they need replicable findings for theory building, for example. If the finding is not replicable, they cannot build the kind of theories that they want to build, which are really about regular events. Um, the more important question is, I think, what does the community value? What is the goal that they are trying to achieve? And how can they make sure that this goal is achieved in the best possible way? It can be that replicability is not a limitation in your field. That is not the problem. It could be, yeah, something else, something that's not on this list. I mean, this is from my background. These are published papers in my research area, but it could be that the, the problems lie somewhere else. But the core of the issue um, will very often be this sort of value challenge. Like what is your field valuing? And is it achieving this to an extent you're happy with? So if it's not replicability in your field, I accept that is perfectly possible. Uh, many fields might not care about it as much. Um, in my field, it's nice if we can repeatedly observe behavior because people are difficult to study and we would like to make sure that we can predict sometimes what happens in the future. Um, sometimes re re replicability is the simplest way to do this, um, but it's not necessary, no. no. Yeah, I, I, I get your point, uh, Danielle, and, and I, I, I can understand it for ethnographic studies, for instance, and, and, and similar stuff. Uh, but, but for me, it's important to understand where you can expect replicability and, and where not. And, and let's talk about history. Uh, when you are an historian and you go to an archive with a clear research question and you come out with a book answering that research question after a few years, that is. Now, is it reasonable to expect that the next historian with the same question and the same ar archive will come out with roughly the same book? Or is that foolish to, to expect? Yeah, so maybe not the same book, but I think we want things to have a certain consistency, right? They have to, the, the methodological procedures we use, if we use similar methodological procedures, they should yield similar results in some <laughs> Um, if that result is an interpretation of evidence, there can be differences in how that evidence is interpreted. But I would say the evidence itself, in the extent, to the extent that, that whatever is in those archives is evidence and we should be able to find it, the procedure we use to find things in that archive should be replicable. Because otherwise, we, it's a very, very difficult thing to have a scientific discussion and reach consensus about things. Now we can discuss whether we want to reach consensus about things in science, but I hope that that, that is something that we hopefully... Uh, would like to achieve as possible. And then we need this replicable basis for the evidence base in any case. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's true. The, 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 there are several uh, participants um, who are saying, well, this is all nice. Uh, only do science that matters. Uh, 
uh, only do important things, and important things need to be replicable um, in, to a large extent. But, but the incentives are pulling us in different uh, ways. Uh, you argue mm. for vacuum cleaning uh, in science as well. Uh, there are ch chores you have to do. Uh, you have to be humble mm -hmm. in a collective. So now, w what can we do and, and who should be responsible to, to rearrange these incentives, which are pulling us to small projects and repeating the same study, more or less the same your whole career? Uh, mm -hmm. We can agree that's, that's not the best way to do it, but the incentives are pulling us in that direction. How can we change that and who is responsible? Yeah. The answer lies at many levels. I just want to point out that there is the possibility to make yourself personally responsible for this. You don't have to, and I understand that, you know, pressures in the environment are strong. And I don't blame anybody for adjusting their behavior to pressures in the environment. But I just want to point out, because it's sometimes ignored, that you can just have certain principles and do the right thing because you think, no matter what the consequences. That putting science first does mean putting science first. It means putting it before maybe even possibility of a career in science. Now, that's very idealistic, I understand. The Bacon quote couldn't be more idealistic, but it's a possibility. It's definitely the role of seniors in the field to make sure that the incentives for juniors are aligned to what we think is valuable. And it means that people who are in a position to shape the behavior uh, or the, the topics in a field for longer term get together and discuss in some sort of meetings what we think is important. Um, there is enough room to make large contributions by collaborating. There can be an extreme case where individual work has almost no value whatsoever. This happened in genomics, for example, where people used to work with tiny data sets. Everything they did was basically a false positive. There, the pressure to move was so strong that they had to choose, okay, we either abandon this field or we start to massively pool data sets. There is no other way. For some reason, many fields don't have this extreme breakpoint where they are forced by basically the possibility to do science to begin with. They, and that is up to us because we accept certain things. In my field, we keep accepting people to say, yes, of course, we only studied undergraduate psychology studies, but we should do this in the future and nobody does it in the future. There should be a point where journals say enough, enough, or funders should say enough. Somewhere a decision needs to be made about what we value and then the incentives from funding and publishing should be aligned with those things. This can only happen in a discussion, also because there are many things we want to improve. We can't do everything at the same time. We have to make clear that there's some transition. So, but, but that's where it needs to happen, right? In these sort of consensus forming discussions. And we can start those now and they are being done. The many babies example, the psychological science accelerator. The psychological science accelerator is a home for many people who have made the choice to spend their research time on a collective project. Yeah. So apparently there are people who want to do this. And it's also fine if many people don't want to do this. But what I would like to see is that the people who want to work in a science like this have a place within their specific fields to work like this. Yeah. Um, and self-organizing those collectives is a good starting point as well. Yeah. Well, that's, that's really nice. Uh, Jeroen de Ridder has a more or less follow-up question of that. Is, is there maybe a role for research institutions to make sure that the science that has, is done matters? And, and maybe more specifically, uh, I'd like to add, in the way they, they judge and reward and assess uh, individuals and collectives, um, and, and what are their recruitive, recruitment strategies in research institutes, are there responsibilities there? That's, that's less democratic, it's less bottom-up, but it might work. Yeah, yeah. Well, they are part of the incentive structure, so there must be a role that they play. They play a role anyway, right? So the question is just, should they maybe change the roles that they play and, and the things that they do? Um, there's the immediate risk that they will mess things up, right? By pushing things in the wrong direction. So I like to think about this on a slight meta level don't maybe immediately force very specific things, but you can force a group of scientists to come up with their own ideas about what they value and what they collectively think. So you can promote that those groups make those decisions for themselves. But if we agree that there needs to be more coordination and there needs to be a bit more team science, then you shouldn't promote specific things maybe, like do this thing or do this thing. You should promote 
that people and communities self-organize and have this discussion among themselves to figure out what their own goals are. That seems to be a pretty good starting point. And as an institution, you can also make choices about who you hire. And I, I have some doubts that we are as welcoming to people who would like to work in large collaborative environments. Um, and one of the um, complaints that many PhD students voice in reasons why they might want to leave academia is the rather individualistic uh, future they will go, go into, where they have to work by themselves and defend their own research lines. So I do think that there is a group of people we are missing out on. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I fully agree, Daniel. Um, Madi uh, Khalidi, um, he poses a question that, that you may be already partly answered, and that is, uh, what is the relation between replicability and truth? Um, and, mm -hmm. and, and maybe tone it down a little bit towards conceptual replication, because that is where it might happen. Yeah, yeah, truth. It's, it's nice to ask questions about truth. Some people scare away from it. So there's a big, big uh, capital T truth, and there's a small letter T truth. I think in science, we have to uh, be happy with small letter T truth. And... Um, there is truth on a claim level, uh, or we can be confident that a claim we make is true. And in replication, what we do is we make claims about data patterns. So that is a very limited forms, form of truth. But we can have a certain claim that is very unlikely to be false about a data pattern that we repeatedly observe. It's very risky to then immediately say, so this theory is true. That's not how it was supposed to work. Uh, people do it very often, or they do the reverse. A data pattern is not replicable and they say, oh, so the theory is false. Both of those have no direct relation to each other. So there's no direct relation, but theories and claims on this higher level are based on data patterns that we observe on this lower level. So replicability and having a replicable effect helps us in the end to make statements that are hopefully a bit closer to the truth. Although, unless we can talk to God directly, we will probably never know. Well, that's that's uh, that's a nice uh, close. I'm going to remember that one. Uh, mm -hmm. James Turner, he he seems to respectably respectively uh, disagree a little bit with you, Danielle, and he says, "Well, now listen. Um, we have seen in in research and science uh, paradigm shifts that were unexpected. No mm -hmm. one would deem that corner of research to be important. So, are we throwing away that all now? Yeah, yeah." That's a very good point. And I think it's an interesting point to study. And what should be studied is actually, how do we balance resources from these free for do your crazy stuff, follow your own passion and ideas kind of research lines? And how much do we spend on, let's all get together and make sure that this measurement tool is reliable enough to build on. And my argument is not for one sort of uniform way of working across science. I greatly value diversity. Also because I think some people are just not motivated to work in large teams and some people love to work by themselves doing this sort of crazy thing that has a very high probability of not leading anywhere, but some probability of being a huge breakthrough. And we need to cater to all of those people. The question is, what should the balance be? And I think my main point is that if you ask people what is valuable, very often they will say, there are these big collective things that we need to figure out and nobody is doing them. Very few people will say, at this moment, we have too few people who are free to do whatever they want and make these surprising breakthroughs because most of that is actually what is already being done. It's the other side that is a bit neglected. So I'm suggesting to move the balance somewhere, not 100% in any direction, but at least up from questions we all value and collectively can pursue if we want to do them well. But there should be some balance. So I definitely, you shouldn't take my story as to say that we don't want to have this other group. We definitely want it. Uh, if you want my number, I'm going to say uh, four days a week on the things we all value. One day a week, you can do whatever you want. Yeah, well, that's, that's nice. There needs to be some freedom, some, some totally. latitude, some possibility. And, and that to some extent, also answer a few questions that, that are flowing in about l'art pour l'art, uh, fundamental science, science pour science, science about which you have no clue where, where, where you're heading, just to, because you're curious how, how it works. And that might be, become very valid uh, and relevant as well in, 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 in the future. Yeah. So you see room for that as well, I believe, uh, Daniel. 
I, I see room for that as well. But even for those research questions, I don't think it's impossible to have a discussion about the value of doing it well to the extent that, okay, so uh, how sure do we want to be that those kind of things are replicable? Uh, do we need to examine the generalizability of those types of studies, right? So there's still certain things that we might not be doing there. Um, and I do think we can have some priors about um, the usefulness of things. We make these decisions as we decide on who gets funding and not all the time. People often make the argument that someone like Einstein couldn't have predicted that his relativity theory would be important for our GPS machines that we have in our car. But I would say that we were pretty, we had some prior that Einstein's relativity theory could have been impactful even back then when he was doing it just for the science. So, yeah. Okay, final point. Uh, time is running out more or less. Uh, I'd like to raise that there is this, this intriguing idea of yours that um, we, we, we might be doing a consensus type of procedure, uh, Delphi or other type of thing, to, to sort out collectively among people who have real knowledge and, and experience in the field collectively with some diversity to decide what matters and what should we do next. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you say a little bit more about it, how you envision that? Should funding agencies arrange that? Should learned societies arrange that? Who should do that? And who should act upon the decisions of these uh, collective consensus meetings? I think the communities themselves should probably do this. And if, if you uh, haven't heard about something like consensus conferences, I would recommend just Googling it and you can see who these people are that organize them. They're researchers working in specific fields who, who recognize the need for some coordination in their field. Most of it is bottom up, but not surprisingly, if they are successful, they can become really scientifically successful and productive if they do it well. And that is what you see. And then there is a certain um, closer connection to funding. Those are more interesting to fund at, at a certain time. So, so there is a bit of room for also then, yeah, maybe prioritizing those kind of collective in funding decisions um, that might happen. But I'm a big fan of diverse um, bottom-up uh, collectives that emerge. Well, that's completely consistent with your other answers, uh, uh, Daniel. I'm not going to, to test it further. Um, thanks again very much for a really interesting lecture and a nice discussion with, with the participants. Um, I'd now like to move on to the, the penultimate part of the program before we have the break. I alluded to that this morning already as well, that we do have a few pitches on every day, pitches from people, uh, early career researchers typically, um, who have some interesting projects going on they'd like to tell us about. There will be no questions, no answers, and only five minutes each. So it's, it's a classical pitch, not completely an elevator pitch, but, but short at, at least. We, we have two today. One was unable to join us today, so uh, we have to do with two. The first of them is Andreas Holst. Um, he is a master student of Maastricht University, and he will tell us about his intriguing project about investigating the occurrence of reporting bias and publication bias in registered reports with the use of P-curves. Uh, Andreas, the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, as you heard, my name is Andreas Holst, and uh, I'll give you a short pitch about my bachelor thesis topic. So, are registered reports an effective method to counter p-hacking? Uh, next slide, please. So, why such a topic? I think most of you here have heard about the replication crisis in sciences from the early 2010s. If not earlier, then definitely in this seminar. In psychology, an open science collaboration study estimated that as much as 61% of research can't be replicated. So, what could we do to better the situation? One solution, as you have heard, was proposed with registered reports. These reports, or maybe rather detailed research plans, are sent to be peer reviewed by journals before any data has been collected. The journal will then decide if the paper is worth publishing, regardless of the results obtained with data collection and analysis. Conceptually, it's a very good idea. But how could we see if this methodological advancement has any effects? Enter the p-curve, which is a distribution of statistically significant p-values. It estimates the evidential value of a set of studies which have significant results. The set 
has evidential value if selective re reporting, meaning p-hacking, can be ruled out as the only reason for the results. So, ah, next slide. Uh, my study's aim uh, was to see if registered reports made a difference to the distribution of p-values, which would then show in the p-curve analysis. Simply put, I hypothesized that the set of studies associated with registered reports would have strong evidential value, while the control group following a normal protocol would have inconclusive results. Um, next slide. Both study sets were experimental, confirmatory psychological research with some additional criteria to increase the validity of the P-curve analysis. Here, it is also crucial to select the correct P-values from the studies to have a valid P-curve. Luckily, the authors of the method have composed very good guidelines for this. Although from experience, it maybe isn't the easiest thing to correctly follow them. So firstly, a set of registered report studies was formed uh, since we had a good exhaustive list of them. And then the control group was matched to them. The aim there was to keep the most publishing related variables as constant as possible. Hmm. Next slide, please. The, here are the results. The, the P-curve analysis uh, results were strikingly similar for both groups. Interestingly, the control group had even a stronger result. The left blue line represents the registered reports group, and the right blue line shows the control group. The null hypothesis of uniform distribution for the right skew test was the red line. Both groups had statistically significant results on the right skew test, and the null was rejected in favor of a right skew, meaning both groups had strong evidential value. Although redundant right now, if the 33% power test behind the green line reaches significance, we reject the null of a very small effect in favor of an even smaller effect. Thus, we could conclude that there is no evidential value there, but this time it wasn't the case. So why so similar results? Well, it could mean that registered reports offers no advantages over standard methods, or maybe we shouldn't be worried about p-hacking at all. Although after hearing this seminar, highly doubtful. Maybe the sample size was too small, or another option is that the study maybe has a confound, more precisely, an editorial confound. In the matching algorithm, the registered reports were matched to control group studies. To do that, I started going one article up, one article down from the registered report in the journal it appeared in. How likely is that the same editor of a journal's issue who put in a registered report is not aware of our current problems in sciences and does not emphasize research quality while evaluating other articles? So, uh, next slide, please. Uh, to conclude, to tease out a possible explanation for the similar results, we'll follow up with a study with a different matching algorithm to avoid this possible editorial confound and to increase the sample size. Uh, thank you. This was the five minutes. Thank you very much, Andreas. Really interesting. Um, the second pitch is, is by Tom van Drimmele. Um, maybe I should say now for something completely different. He will talk about, uh, he's an ethnographer, to, to, to be clear, um, um, working at Leiden University Medical Center on his PhD thesis on this topic. And his talk is about researcher decision making, how to exercise discretion when navigating ambiguity, a lot of different words today, um, in research practice. Tom, you can pronounce this much better. There you go. I'll certainly give it a try. Uh, so, um, welcome to this short pitch in our research project on researcher discretion. My name is Tom van Dribbelen. My colleagues on this project are Nienke Slagboom, Ria Reis, Lex Bouter, and Jenny van der Steen. What I'll be pitching here is the what, the why, and the how of our current research project. And let's start with the what. The what is researcher discretion. 
Throughout the research process, researchers encounter many conceptual, methodological, and ethical decisions to make. There's different goals to pursue, different ways of getting to these goals. There's different values to adhere to, and a complex context to take into account. And these factors often conflict with one another. Researchers are guided by rules, guidelines, and standard practices, but the ultimate decision is in the hands of the researcher. Which brings us to the definition of our main research concept, researcher discretion, which we've defined as the freedom and responsibility to make uh, research decisions based on experience, knowledge, and insight into the situation at hand. So what does this look like for us researchers? Uh, think about questions, which idea to develop, uh, how to phrase a survey question, in which journal to publish, and everything in between. Now, it's important to note that this research and discretion is not inherently undesirable. For one, this is exactly the reason why we're not likely to be replaced by robots or algorithms anytime soon. There's value in it. Now that the what is covered, let's continue with the why. The why uh, research on this discretionary space is critical considering the extensive effect that researcher discretion has on topics, methods, and outcomes. We want to be able to facilitate researchers to exercise their discretion responsibly. But studying the, the, the subject is difficult because the uncertainty involved in a decision has a short expiration date. We may take a long time to come to a research decision but as soon as it's made and the results are known, it's very difficult to recollect the uncertainty once surrounding the decision. And we're all familiar with this effect. Uh, after you've made a large purchase, the options that you didn't buy are likely to escape your memory. Or the opposite, actually. I should have bought that iPhone instead of my stupid Samsung. As a result, interview, focus group, and survey studies only capture a specific secondary perspective of the logic and deliberation of the researchers at the time of the decision, that of the rear view mirror. Instead, we're looking for a perspective from the passenger seat as we're moving forward, which brings us to the how, ethnography. We'll be employing ethnographic methods to get a direct empirical perspective on researcher discretion. This methodology is based mainly on participant observation, triangulated with document research, semi-structured interviews, and regular member checking. I, as the ethnographer, will spend four to six months in two different research groups. Like Malinowski, pictured here, did about 100 years ago on some islands off Papua New Guinea, uh, but minus the obvious racist and colonial undertones, I will embed myself into these research groups and observe and take note of when and how researchers exercise their discretion. In doing so, I will take care to reflect on my own influence on the situation as an observer as well. An example of the kinds of things that we can observe with this methodology is the following situation. A junior researcher proposes an extra step to, the, to her supervisors but upon seeing their skeptical faces towards the end of her sentence, she quickly backtracks and proposes that they go on as planned. The dismissal of this extra research step is an exercise of researcher discretion, which is likely to be missed entirely in most evaluations of the study, even if we have a verbatim transcript of the research meeting because nothing was said. For us, it's the start of an investigation. Why was it dismissed? Does this happen more often? and what kind of ideas are dismissed like this. We hope to inform you of the outcome of these investigations somewhere next year. After the what, the why, and the how, we've now come to the end. Uh, and what I'd still like to share is an early lesson of this research project for me personally, which is the sheer ubiquity of researcher discretion. It's simply everywhere, and sometimes it feels like a large responsibility to bear. It's made me personally much more aware and reflective of all my decisions throughout the research process, which is likely why my supervisors keep telling me to hurry up a bit as well. There has to be a balance. Um, thanks so much for your attention. And if any questions remain or arise, be sure to let us know. Well, thank you very much, Sam. It reminds me of, of people training to become a doctor who get all these illnesses themselves, uh, at least symptom wise. Uh, um, and I hope that your work will, will look like the classical text on science in actions and laboratory life, which I enjoyed so much when I was a student. 
Um, and with that, we come to the end of the morning's program, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you very much for attending, for being there. Um, you and we now deserve a lunch break, and we will reconvene sharp at 2 o'clock in the afternoon for an interesting afternoon program again. Thank you very much for the time being.